Hi, my name is Brian Capo, and welcome to this week's Ask Brian part of our weekly newsletter. Remember to subscribe, and if you want to submit a question or subscribe to the newsletter, look right above the YouTube comments section below in the video description. Okay, this week I'm going to answer a question that I get frequently enough that we have it in our Executive Data Science Coursera specialization. So if you want to see a lot more on this topic, you know, enroll in that specialization. I think both data science in real life and the introductory course in that sequence cover this topic a fair amount. And the topic is basically, um, I got a, well basically the question asked me, you Brian seem to be like a more classical statistician and why is that and why don't you do more machine learning stuff? Well first let me answer the fact that I do a fair amount of machine learning stuff and we've even engaged in a couple of uh, prediction competitions and that sort of thing, a Kaggle competition at one point, and a couple prediction competitions in uh, brain imaging. Um, however, I want to discuss, at least from my perspective, some of the key aspects of the distinction between what machine learning is sort of giving us and what more classical statistical procedures are giving us. And this, of course, is mostly based on my perception of how I use the two. Uh, and again, if you want a lot more detail on this, we cover it both in the data science in real life and other class in uh, our executive data science specialization on Coursera, but also the practical machine learning class and regression modeling classes in our data science specialization cover a lot of these topics in great detail. So let me talk about machine learning and what I like about machine learning. And one is, you know, m machine learning is very user friendly. I, I mean, so I don't study machine learning as a matter of research. I use me machine learning as part of my research, but I don't want to develop new deep learning algorithms or that sort of thing myself. I just want to be a user of them. And I find it's often pretty easy to get off the ground on these things, much easier than it is for me to get off the ground in a statistical technique, a new modeling technique. Um, now, basically, because the collection of machine learning algorithm contains most of the classical statistical approaches as special cases, you're, you're necessarily going to get better predictions, right? Uh, especially because there's things that you can do like model stacking, etc., to prevent overfitting when you try lots of different things. So you're, you're almost always going to do better. Now, there's, a, in my experience, often not that much better but pretty much almost always better when you use some of these more machine learning type approaches than a, than a pure linear regression type approach or something like that. They tend to be quite automated, so I, that's why I think they're very popular in, the, popular in these settings like uh, online retail and companies like that who don't care so much about why their model is fitting well, they just need it to do well, and they need it to fit sort of automatically, and they have a lot of data. So in financial applications, often this is the case as well. Uh, so again, you know, this goes to some of the earlier points. It's very black boxy, right? You know, you don't really have to care too much about what's going on under the hood. You need to know a little bit about what's the best ways to tweak the dials for your particular application. But other than that, um, you don't really need to know a lot about the internals, which can't really be said for most classical statistical procedures. You do, of course, have to worry about overfitting, and that's, a, that's the biggest problem with, uh, the most commonly cited problem with machine learning predictions is that they throw a lot of parameters at the problem, and so because of that, you can overfit almost instantaneously. Uh, deep learning, which is what everyone's trying these days, it really adds a lot of parameters with each layer that you add to these neural networks. So, you know, uh, overfitting is a, clearly a problem, but it's a recognized problem and there's a lot of solutions to it. Uh, a, a problem that doesn't get talked about quite as much is this idea of generalizability. Generalizability from a classical statistic, statistical test is given by the connection of your data to a population level model and that theoretical construct is what's helping give you generalizability. If the model is correct, then you're getting generalizability. Uh, on the other hand, for machine learning, it's very hard to get generalizability. And then you often see things, like, in, especially in conjunction with overfitting, where machine learning works quite well for a particular data set and doesn't, work, what, doesn't generalize when applied to other data sets. Now, you can combat that. Again, first, you, you want to try to combat the overfitting. But you can also try to combat that by trying and building your algorithm on de novo data sets. Uh, and I think the general approach in machine learning is to do this from a data-driven 
purely empirical sense. And I think that's why it, it very much appeals to data scientists because they like to as much as possible rely on the data and a little bit less so on models and con conceptual uh, uh, conceptual models and, and, and scientific models and that sort of thing would rather purely rely on the data. One thing that I think just, uh, this seems to be the most common problem when I have collaborators of mine that want to work on machine learning is they tend to have a very optimistic view that some of these fancier algorithms can apply on really small data sets. So they'll come to me with 40, 40 subjects or 40 independent measurements uh, with lots of predictors and say, hey, can we run uh, deep learning on this and it's sort of you know it, it's sort of uh, uh, at face value kind of a ridiculous thing to do uh, you know and and where these algorithms are having tremendous success is often in big companies like Google and Facebook where they have you know millions and millions of people labeling images to build the training data that you need in order to fit these really high dimensional high parameter models and then they do quite well and they're hard to beat and they're also very automated and so I think people like them so I think in those settings it's kind of clear that they're a great thing to do. Now let's talk about what kind of classical statistics does. Now I, I think machine learning is part of statistics so when I say classical statistics what I'm really talking about is really placing a lot of emphasis on the model and achieving parsimony. Parsimony meaning the simplest possible explanation of the data that still fits it reasonably well. Okay, So that you err on the side of simpler explanations and the, the, the parsimony is I think a, a key property of classical statistical approaches. You want a simple model and the reason you want these simple models is because one of interpretability and another because of the idea of knowledge creation. If you think about most of the ways in which we've created permanent knowledge in history is when we've created a parsimonious model. Like think for example something like Newtonian physics. It wasn't exactly right but it was a very parsimonious simple model for explaining how the world worked and so it did, it did generate not good predictions as a result but because it was a good model. But also it was nice to interpret and uh, relatively easy to understand. Of course, if you're going to do this kind of approach, you have to worry about inference. You have to worry about connecting your data to a population via the model, and you need to worry about all the considerations that go into that process, which is quite, I think, challenging and intricate and deep, but I think worth it in certain areas. If you're in science, you care a lot about the model. You care a lot about these parameters, and these parameters mean a lot to you in the model that you're fitting and you care a lot about knowledge creation and parsimony and all of these other things, they very much so mean things to you and so because of that I think in, in these cases uh, statistical approach, more classical statistical approaches are often preferable. Of course for generalizability, what you're getting out of generalizability is that you're getting hopefully a conceptual model that's true. If you fit, if you were to discover Hooke's law, right, um, by virtue of a model Right, then that should apply to other springs right, and other things like that where, um, where, where you've, you've come up with a general principle that was validated by data but the model also combined some a priori scientific knowledge all blended together. And so if you've done that as a pure prediction problem it's possible that you fit it on the set of springs that you had and then when you applied it to a different set of springs things just weren't common enough for you to really for your intricate algorithm to actually understand how to generalize to this new population. Now prediction people would say okay well, we just train on more springs, chain on more variety of springs, train on new data sets, get generalizability that way and we'll get we'll wind up at the same place and that's of course true but you need a lot of data to do that and you, at, at the end of that process you haven't created a parsimonious model of how the scientific process works in this particular example. So if you care about that and you care about generalizability of that sort then statistical modeling is clearly going to do very well. And then you know if you have little data right like if you have relatively few observations right you don't have the data to fit all these parameters so what, what else can you need? Well you have to fill in the gaps with uh, scientific hypotheses and models and things like that. Okay, so, so to me these are some of the core considerations. I think there's other considerations and there's also instances where the two fields bleed into each other. People have tried to bring some of these concepts from classical modeling into machine learning and of course people have tried to bring some of these machining learning techniques into more classical styles of analysis and so the, the clear distinction between the two is getting grayer and grayer as time goes on. 
Uh, having said that, I think if you're a data scientist, it's worthwhile to know and understand both approaches well and when they apply and when one is useful and when, when the other one is useful. Okay, uh, the same person who asked this question actually also asked me what my favorite food is. I think uh, for savory type foods, I think my favorite things are kind of um, things like Indian food, Thai food, uh, Ethiopian food. So just to complete the question, uh, th those I think would, would be my three favorite kinds of cuisine. I like them. I like them a lot. So. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Uh, again, subscribe if you get the chance. Submit a question. Subscribe to the newsletter and see the other things going on. You know, listen to Roger Pang's not uh, Roger Pang and Hillary Parker and Roger Pang and Elizabeth Matsui's uh, uh, podcast. They're great. Um, I listen to them every time they put one out as well. And uh, hope to see you next week.